libros de que eran los libros de él. One group says no más to bilingual education. Now they want it out of your child's classroom. Live from WHDHTV Boston. This is 7 News at 5.30 on the news station. A new move to end bilingual education in Bay State classrooms. Right now, immigrant children can speak and learn in their native tongue. But as 7's Ryan Owen shows us, some say it's doing more harm than good. Chris, the man who almost single-handedly got rid of bilingual education in both California and Arizona now has a new target, Massachusetts, which happens to be home to the state's, the country, I should say, his oldest bilingual education law. Today, that man took his case to lawmakers here on Beacon Hill. <laughs> One class, two teachers, two languages. When they lived in Provincetown, what was the soil? These Framingham yeah. fifth graders are learning history and English, reading in Spanish. You don't always have to just speak the same language every day. You could mix it up a little so they could have some fun. It's called two-way bilingual education. 20 native English-speaking students and 20 Spanish speakers learn together every day. In a few years, all 40 are bilingual. It's just one of the programs this California millionaire wants to eliminate. If you get rid of bilingual education, the test scores of students in Massachusetts will rise as rapidly as they have in California. Ron Unn says immigrant children are better off if they have one year, and only one year, to learn English. It would be a sink or swim situation. It would be throwing them to an all-English program where they cannot, they cannot learn. Critics call the plan anti-immigrant and racist. These children just call it unfair. I think if they take it away, um, other kids won't have the advantage that we have. They'll just have to learn English. You most definitely have not heard the last of this controversy. That millionaire from California, Ron Unz, is trying to get this put up to a popular vote in November. That is exactly how he won in both California and Arizona. Live at the State House, Ryan Owens, 7 News. Live from CBS 12, this is 12 News at 5. Right now at 5.30, protesters speak out against the bill to stop funding for bilingual education. Advocates of bilingual education are out in full force on Smith Hill right now. They're protesting a bill to get rid of bilingual education altogether. And the heated debate is expected to last a good part of this evening. People who support bilingual education are outraged that some lawmakers want to get rid of it. More than 5,000 students in the Providence School District alone can speak another language better than they can speak English. Some people say bilingual education gets kids ready for an English language classroom, but Murph George has a different plan. What I really, really want is for students to be able to learn English as, as rapidly and as efficiently as they possibly can. The intent of this legislation is to make sure that those parents and those students that need that service have the service delivered to them in the most efficient and effective way possible. Some lawmakers want to ditch bilingual education and embrace English as a second language. Bilingual education teachers say doing away with the program will hurt the students and eventually the entire state. And News Channel 10's Dan Janning is live down city with the latest. Dan? Well, good evening, Gene, and good evening, everyone. That misinformation, according to the school superintendent, coming from a few who had personal agendas, maybe fearing possible job cuts as a result of the superintendent's plans. But nonetheless, this caused a lot of panic with parents. So tonight, a meeting for the superintendent to address their concerns and give them the real story. Are there problems with the current ESL program? I think that our, all of our programs are under review, and bilingual is no exception. Is there problems with it, though? Uh, I think that there is room for improvement, absolutely. With half or more students in bilingual classes failing all or most of their subjects, there's no doubt room for improvement. That's why Providence's school superintendent is setting the record straight with parents. Despite rumors and misinformation, she is not eliminating English as a second language programs or bilingual programs, and she's not eliminating jobs. She's trying to make these programs more effective. We don't want to dismantle bilingual education. We really want to strengthen it. We want it to be quality programs. The plan? Review the current programs and get parent input. Create a bilingual advisory council. 
expand the bilingual program and get a support system. Team Teach with a bilingual guidance counselor. The creation of an international high school with dual language bilingual programs and stronger transitional support. There is no transition. I want to be able to create that transition that will help and support our students. A sigh of relief from misinformed parents who left the meeting now supporting the superintendent. Through a translator, Emma Vila summed up how many parents feel. My biggest concern is to make sure that my children are in a secure, well-defined program so that my children could progress. Now, as you know, unfortunately, it all comes down to money. How do you fund these kind of programs? The superintendent says she will work the, with the school committee to fund these programs and that it shouldn't be a problem. There'll be another informational meeting like the one this evening on Thursday morning, and then look for some more public forums to get input on these programs, programs that will go into effect here in Providence, September 2002. We're live from our Down City studio here in Providence. I'm Dan Janik, News Channel 10. Let's go back. Watching the Associated Press News Station of the Year. Now, coverage you can count on. This is News Center 5. Bilingual education has been a staple of Massachusetts education policy for some 30 years. It has expanded to the point of offering academics in scores of languages and carrying students in those programs for years. Now, studies show children in bilingual ed score poorly when tested prompting critics to say, do away with the program, and proponents to say, reform it, make it work. New Center 5's Jim Boyd was at a state house hearing on the issue today. Bilingual education was implemented in Massachusetts in 1971 to gradually assimilate non-English speaking students into the school systems. Now many say it's time for change. They unveil their proposals before the legislature's education committee as it considers reforming bilingual ed for the first time in 30 years. Representative Antonio Cabral says an overhaul is necessary. What we need to do is we need to do a comprehensive reform. One state legislator says bilingual education has been a disaster. Senator Guy Glotus of Worcester wants to scrap bilingual ed and replace it with a one-year immersion program where students learn English as fast as possible. Bilingual education has failed the very students it was intended to help. But the director of the bilingual education program for the city of Boston says the program should not be scrapped, just improved. Bilingual education is good education when it's uh, delivered, implemented properly. And what we are hoping to do is to heighten the level of accountability uh, for our students and the staff working in those programs, as well as districts and cities. And some feel all students need more versatile language skills in today's global environment. It's often said in Europe that people who speak three languages are identified as trilingual, and people who speak two languages are called bilingual. What do you call someone who speaks one language? American. Cabral says he expects his proposal to survive in some fashion in time to be implemented for the start of the 2002-2003 school year. In Boston, I'm Jim Boyd, New Center 5. Our website has set up a discussion uh, place for you on bilingual education. If you'd like to air your opinion, you can log on to thebostonchannel.com. News 40, awarded news station of the year by the Associated Press. With coverage you can count on, this is News 40 Nightcast. For years, the Holyoke school system has taught students through a bilingual curriculum. The transitional program teaches students in Spanish until they're comfortable with the English language. But as News 40's Katherine Shepherdson reports, some educators are pushing for a new English immersion program. Like many Holyoke parents, Dora Torres worries about how her children will adjust to learning English as a second language. As the minority population continues to grow, educators say it's becoming more difficult to accommodate all students. One of the problems I see in Holyoke is that we've had um, the one program, Transitional Bilingual Education, and we say this shoe fits everybody's foot, and it really doesn't. The past year, the city has experimented with an immersion program at the Kelly Elementary School. Unlike bilingual education, the focus on English starts day one, and so far these students have made significant progress. 
School committee members met on a forum to discuss immersion. Ken Noonan, school superintendent in California, spoke about how their state made the switch three years ago. He criticized the bilingual education and its approach to learning English. Concentrate so much on Spanish that the English language skills aren't transferred early enough for the children to have good success in school. So the dropout rates continue to rise in the Latino community and the number of students not graduating from high school, not going on to university, I think is tied very directly to language. But proponents of bilingual education say good programs get good results. That starts with assessing which model best meets the needs of their school. Students who are coming into our school system need to be able to develop cognitively and linguistically at their own levels. And a bilingual program allows them to do that while they're learning English. That was Katherine Shepherdson. Just one foot of distance saves a woman's life. That story tops tomorrow tonight. News 40's look at tomorrow's headlines in the Springfield Union News. Apparently a gust of wind blew an oak tree onto a woman's car in West Springfield, missing her by only a foot. California superintendent tells the Holyoke audience that scrapping bilingual education raised test scores in his state. And expect to see the name Smith & Wesson on a major stock exchange. Now, Margie Reedy, Chet Curtis, this is Newsnight on NECN. You should have an individualized, a, pro a program that's more individualized, not one size fits all. It's a debate about language and literacy, cultural identity, and getting ahead the American way. Tonight, Massachusetts hears the call for radical change in bilingual education. The Supreme Court has American human blood on their hands. Also tonight, marijuana and medical need. The Supreme Court speaks, but will states go their own way? Good evening, I'm Margie Reedy. There is finally an issue the entire U.S. Supreme Court agrees on. I'm Chet Curtis. The issue is the medical use of marijuana. The judges are against it, but the battle isn't over. I'll have more later tonight. But first tonight, the Massachusetts State House today, there were diverse accents and diverse views on the subject of bilingual education. English immersion is the new rallying cry of reformers who say bilingual education has failed. Two years ago, the English immersion forces were big winners in California. And now supporters of bilingual education are digging in for a fight. NECN's Tina Detal has the story. This is Mary Guerrero's third grade class. All the kids come from Spanish-speaking homes. In fact, that is their first language, English. So I'll follow them here. right now. When I write a uh, word like it's not supposed to be, they, they correct it for me, and I read it, and now and I go like, oh, now I understand. Fanatis spoke mostly Spanish when she moved from the Dominican Republic to Lawrence last year. Now she speaks Spanish and English fluently, as does her teacher. They say the, the main idea of, of the lesson has been taught in English. When they group up, they can use their own native language or any words that they bring to the subject to try to express and, and convey meaning. But then we'll try to bring it back into the English as they work through the stages. Guerrero says the superintendent here in Lawrence is looking to change okay, the bilingual education a little, moving towards having separate native language and English concentrated classes as well. It's similar to the proposal suggested by Representative Antonio Cabral. The main objective or the main goal of TVE is to teach English. But utilizing the strength of that student, which is his home language, for him or her to continue their academic development on math, science, social studies, history. So when they move from, when they finally transition to mainstream, they are not three to five years behind. Senator Guy Gladys wants to replace bilingual education with one year of English immersion. My bill will address the same issue as California's Proposition 227. And there were a lot of critics of that bill originally. Since that bill has been incorporated in California, test scores have gone up 20, 50, and sometimes 100% for bilingual students. But the Massachusetts Commissioner of Education wants to see bilingual education reformed, not abandoned. TVE doesn't fit all kids. Instruction immersion doesn't fit all kids. So I think this is moving in the right direction, providing choices. Back in Guerrero's classroom, she also sees the benefits of having choices, 
when it comes to helping students learn. Different students respond well to different programs. It's not like it's one size fits all when it comes to bilingual education, just like it is for any type of education. Now this debate over how to teach bilingual students is not a new one. It's been going on for more than a quarter century. Massachusetts bilingual law was passed in 1971, and at that time it was the first in the nation. It also hasn't changed much since then. In Boston, Tina Detel, NECN. And my guests tonight are taking opposing sides on the future of bilingual education. State Representative Mary Roganis favors English immersion to replace bilingual education. And State Representative Antonio Cabral supports a modified form of the current bilingual education system. Thanks to both of you for joining us tonight. Representative Cabral, what's wrong with English immersion? You're talking about you wanting some different sort of systems. We haven't had a change in 30 years. What's wrong with just teaching the children in English, focusing on that? Well, that's going back 30 years. We know we had the immersion 30 years ago. The immersion did not work 30 years ago. We, we know that for a fact. We have the numbers. We have all the studies. We have all the results of an immersion program 30 years ago. That's precisely why we changed and we reformed 30 years ago into a transitional bilingual program uh, method or format. All right, uh, Representative Roganis, is that in fact going back in time then? Well, 30 years ago, with the very highest hoped Massachusetts passed the transitional bilingual education law. It's my belief that it has not functioned as it was anticipated to. The failure is there in the faces of the kids who are stuck in a segregated mm. classroom and not being prepared for the future adequately. Well, if, if English immersion was used before, uh, Representative Cabral said not with very good effect. Well, How I, is this going to be different? In, in that day and age, I'm not sure it was without good effect, but no one that I'm aware of is advocating going back to the old days of sink or swim, drop the kid into a classroom. We're talking about a supportive classroom that has a teacher who can provide assistance and support in the native language of the child as needed, but is focusing on getting the child quickly into an English learning setting and into the mainstream of the school. Well, that's what some people say, that the kids are sort of allowed to languish too long and being able to rely upon their native language aren't really, I mean, English is the goal, is it not? English is the goal. It's always been the goal. It will always be the goal of transitional bilingual education. It is the goal of this major reform that we are proposing um, uh, because we believe English is an important acquisition to, to, to reach uh, in order for, for the eventual success of mm -hmm. that student in this country. In simple terms, uh, how would you change the current system? It's very simple. Uh, we have two, the, the bill really, it's the first major overhaul, major comprehensive reform in bilingual education in the state since the original law was put in place in 1972. We would um, uh, do two major things. One, we would do all the, uh, all the changes to reflect the other reform of 93, have bilingual education reflect reflect around accountability, around standards, around assessment tools to reflect the reform of 93. In addition to that... Okay, well, we don't know what 93, what that was. Well, I mean, the, the curriculum frameworks, the MCAS... Okay, so with you know, all the all, other students are dealing with. That's right. Okay. So we're putting in place accountability, not only for the student, but the school system, for DOE, the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. We we'll set up the standards that every student has to meet. These students would have to meet as well. We we'll would create assessment tools for their English proficiency, okay. uh, annual testing for the English proficiency. With that sort of testing then and, and that sort of accountability, what's wrong with that system? You're, they're certainly being pushed to the goals that it sounds like you and many other education reformers want. I, I read the bill and the proviso is that in some settings 30 percent of their school day is in their native language. I don't see how they can meet all the goals of a modern <coughs> MCAS requirement and still spend 30 percent of their time outside of the mainstream. But isn't it difficult, I mean, if you're trying to teach a child math or science or something like that, trying to teach them that in addition to having on top of that the, the extra layer of teaching it in a language they're not very familiar with, when doesn't that just slow down the learning? We're talking about the entire K through 12 spectrum. When you have a kindergarten child, I don't think that child needs to be taught 30% of the day in a non-English <coughs> language. What about that? Well, I think, I think that's... Uh, the argument here is English only. That's what they're proposing. We know that doesn't work. What we need to do is really to seriously look how people learn, how people acquire language. In the process, it's important to use the, their strengths. And the strength is their home language, their native language, to continue their 
education progress or their education development in math and science and history, as you mentioned. Because if we don't do that, then they're going to fall behind three to five years by the time they have enough proficiency in English to perform all those core subjects in English. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we know all this, if I may add, sure. we know uh, all the information that we have available to us that when someone, regardless if it's a bilingual student, or if it's an English native speaker, if they fall behind in school three to five years, they'll never be able to catch up. Don't these kids need a jump start at the beginning? Turn, oh yes, and they will get it with the structured or sheltered immersion that's being tried in schools and it's really being tried in many cases against the existing law. That's one reason that we're trying to change the law to allow diversity in, in the way the education is provided. Tony is really talking about the philosophy that was behind the 1971 law that the native language strengths have to be enforced first. The results in California have shown that this is not the case with All documented right. test results. Well, you've given me the perfect jumping off point because that's where we're going next. Coming up, we'll hear from a man who helped eliminate bilingual education in California and now wants to do it in Massachusetts. Californian Ron Unz, when Newsnight returns. I work with these students. I have the opportunity to show them how intelligent they are. Not just show others, show them so they don't buy into the sense that they have nothing to offer. Yes, they come from another culture. Yes, they speak another language. That only adds to their ability to understand more. It doesn't take away anything away from them. The theory of bilingual education is that children of non-English background would be offered basic subjects in their native language while learning to speak English as they progress through grade levels. Now reformers are attacking both the theory and the practice of bilingual education. They say total English immersion would be a better way to go. Ron Unz led the fight for English immersion in California. Then he went national with the cause. Ron Unz joins us by phone now from Palo Alto, California. Good evening to you, sir. Great to be here. Um, now, you were one of the people who helped get Proposition 227 passed in California. It passed overwhelmingly, 61% of the vote. Are people happy with it now? Does it seem like these students are being successful? I think the success has really been tremendous. In fact, after the initiative passed, about six months or a year later, as uh, the measures started being implemented in the schools, journalists from most of the major state newspapers went into the classrooms. They talked to the ex-bilingual teachers. They talked to the children. They talked to the parents. And virtually all the reports were absolutely glowing. You had all these teachers who had said, I opposed the initiative. I thought it would be a disaster. But the children I'm teaching are learning English so much more quickly than I ever expected. Furthermore, in the last couple of years, the test scores have started coming out. And what they have shown is that the statewide test standardized test scores of over a million immigrant students in California have risen by an average of 40% in less than two years. Okay. And that Perfect. average includes the districts which try to avoid implementing the initiative. Those that have fully and strictly eliminated all their bilingual programs have doubled their test scores in less than two years. All right, let's check with uh, Representative Antonio Cabral about that. Do, do you believe in that success, and is, is the proof in the pudding sort of there? I mean, we can always use numbers and statistics for our own argument. I mean, this is uh, what's important here, and the numbers that they keep repeating about California is not a statewide number. It's about specific school districts in California, and the... I mean, we can use those, those arguments. This is really not about California. Massachusetts is different than California. Our experience is different. Our solutions... How would they be, be different? different? How would it be a different experience? Or why would the solutions need to be different? Because it is a different experience. We have different needs in Massachusetts. We have different standards in Massachusetts that we need to meet. Uh, we have the, such, as, such as the Ed Reform of 93, which is... That's not the case in California. And I, I think that really you cannot compare uh, what, what th was taking place in California versus what might be taking place in Mexico. Mr. Ernst, what's about that? Now that you have not only spearheaded this effort in California, but also most recently in Arizona, where it's passed as well, with a high uh, immigrant popul population there, and now have talked about the possibility of bringing this to Massachusetts. Do you really think that you can sort of do a cookie-cutter approach in, in all of these different states? Well, it seems to me that immigrant children in Massachusetts are very similar to immigrant children in California. And all of the arguments which I heard in the earlier segment being made by the representative against English immersion were exactly word for word the same arguments that similar individuals made in California against our initiative. Yet once it passed, and now that it's been implemented, the huge rise in the test scores and all the anecdotal stories 
of teachers and principals and parents so pleased with the results have really switched a lot of people around. In fact, one of the strongest advocates of the initiative now and supporters of English immersion is a man named Ken Noonan, who was for 30 years an advocate of bilingual education, but when he, the initiative passed, he followed the law. He's now a school superintendent. He doubled his students' test scores in less than two years, now, and he admits that he was wrong so for 30 years. Furthermore, let let, me no, 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 let me oh, ask you sure. a question here, please. Um, are these districts that are better districts to begin with, um, perhaps they have higher test scores. Are these sort of the shining stars? And do you have the harder test cases in certain areas of California? Absolutely not. In other words, the districts that have shown the most improvement have been the ones that completely eliminated their bilingual programs. They many times had very low test scores before. Now the test scores have doubled in less than two years. Furthermore, the pattern is extremely clear. In other words, those districts that tried to keep their bilingual programs, that dragged their heels, in a couple of cases were legally exempt from the initiative, have shown minimal improvement in immigrant test scores. All right, Representative Cabral, is, that, is this a case here of people just not wanting to go through the change and being afraid mm. of no, this is trying a case, in the system? Uh, the case that uh, Mr. Hines uh, presents is English-only approach, which is an English-only movement that he believes in. Uh, we believe that education is more than just about language. It's about learning knowledge, acquiring knowledge. So why not use the best language available at the time to, to transmit that knowledge and making sure that student does learn what needs to be learned. Mm -hmm. Representative Rogers, one of the things that uh, the representative is proposing here is sort of a two-tiered approach where the students would learn two languages. They would hold on to their native language, they would practice that in addition to learning English and both would be used in the classroom. What's wrong with that? Doesn't that make for a better educated I'd student? I'd say experience has shown that that does not work. When you have teachers who are not truly bilingual, a child is not going to learn English. The teacher doesn't speak English, the child won't. My hope for Massachusetts is that we can have the same results as California without having to go through the initiative petition. But I do believe that there is so much popular interest in changing the way we educate language minority students that if the legislature won't do it, the voters will. Ron? Uh, well, uh, Ron, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> well, let me ask Ron this question. Okay. You know, do you, why, why should you be coming to Massachusetts? A lot of people say that. They say, no, wait, this is a Californian. Let him be involved in California politics. But why are you coming here to tell the people of this state how to run their school system? You've raised an excellent point. I do not live in Massachusetts. I actually went to school in Massachusetts, but that was a number of years ago. I really would feel very uncomfortable coming into Massachusetts and assisting an initiative unless I was asked to come in by a credible, critical mass of credible local supporters. In other words, people who come from an immigrant background or an educational background who have a lot of personal credibility on the issue of immigrant education. If they said that they wanted to move forward with an initiative and asked my help and my advice, I would gladly lend it. And is this but really I just what's will behind? Not move forward unless such people ask me to. All right. Is this really what's behind an English-only movement, sort of trying to eliminate other languages well, from our I, culture? I, I, I mean, you go now, you have to say whether you want to use English or another language when you go to the bank or sometimes on the phone and things like no, that. I mean, Some those, people would like those, to remove those, that. Those are completely different issues. In other words, you know, it's very different from saying, for example, that a lot of people, say Spanish language or Chinese language people, live in their neighborhood. Maybe, for example, some of the documents should be in that language, or, for example, the ATM, the cash machines should be in that language. I, I think, you know, that's a practical issue, and sometimes it makes sense. On the other hand, I really don't see any reason in the world that young immigrant children are not immediately taught English as soon as they go to school. Okay, let me get uh, Representative Cabral. Well, I mean, this is the same old argument all over, all over again. Uh, this is based on fear that people are not going to learn English uh, we know that over generations people always learn English. Actually, it happens the other way around. You have a tendency of losing the home language and the native language. You, you, not, you don't have to go very far. Most of us, or all of us really are from immigrant stock, and most of us do not speak a second language because we lost it in the process. In Massachusetts, we do have, as part of the reform of 93, a requirement for students to learn a second language. The other requirement in there is that the, the students be taught about their culture w if they come from another culture. Is that really necessary? Is that where some of these critics, though, may get some ammunition and saying, why do they need to be taught about their home culture? They should be taught about America and about 
English. Yeah, I thought yeah, I thought about America, but it's also important to be uh, to be to have self-esteem and know it's important that your culture is also an important one. It's important to know that not all the writers or good writers, good authors, is in the English language. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not all British, for that, for that matter. Um, so I think that's the whole concept of, of creating a better student, a better citizen, to really progress in the society. The okay. skills that are needed, uh, the skills that are needed, uh, are important to the point that we must must move beyond this fear that people are not going to learn English. Okay. And all right, I'm sorry, we just need to move on. Right. Representative Rogas, final word? Well, it's not the function of the American public schools to teach an English child about England, an Irish child about Ireland, or a Chinese child about China. We're supposed to teach them our curriculum and uh, enable them to succeed in our society, which they can do when they learn English well. You'd like well, a quick rebuttal? Okay, well, I, uh, Basically, it is the responsibility of the public schools in this country, in this state, to provide an equal opportunity for each child to succeed. And that's what this major reform that I presented today uh, will do, will continue to do, and uh, all the numbers are, and the information and all the studies are really on our side. All right, we will see what the legislature does with this question. Thanks, both of you, for being with us tonight. My guests, Mary Rogness, Antonio Cabral, and Ron Unz. And so we'll see what the legislature does with this when they get it. Now, Ron Unz and his group say they will only step in if it is not taken up and passed by the legislature, but um, I don't know. It, it is interesting. They're, they have targeted a number of states, Massachusetts among them, saying that we have the strictest standards for bilingual education. Yeah, it's becoming such an emotional and sensitive sure. issue. You can understand that. And, yes. Uh, it's far from over, and we, you, the next step will be played out in the legislature. Right. Twenty Two News, winner of the Associated Press Best Newscast Award. Now, live, working for you throughout Western Massachusetts, this is the news leader, 22 News at 6. Should the state put an end to bilingual education? An effort to put the question before voters is in the works. Good evening and welcome to 22 News at 6. I'm Barry Krieger. And I'm Sonia Baghdadi. Those who want to close down the state's bilingual education system have announced a ballot initiative that would do just that. They are characterizing bilingual education as a failure that they say only handicaps children, kids who they say should learn English before anything else. Dan Elias joins us now with more on this story, Dan. Well, our state's bilingual education system is the oldest in the nation. It's been around for 30 years, but those against it say that it's failed. They point to problems experienced by too many bilingual ed students, like low MCAS scores, low college admission rates, and a high number of dropouts. But supporters say dropping bilingual education entirely is far too drastic. In Springfield's North End, sixth grader Louis Rosa says it's hard to perform well in school with a limited ability in English. Either I'm Puerto Rican and it's easier to talk in Spanish. But in English, it's kind of difficult because I talk slow. Bilingual education allows students who speak other languages to learn academic subject matter in their native tongues while also learning English. The program's required by the state and it's in widespread use in the Springfield school system, but the new superintendent says it does need review. Well, I think we're trying to look at whether it's working right now or not. We, we haven't had uh, the level of uh, achievement of Hispanic students in our community that we would like to see. There's some concern that the bilingual program may be contributing to that. A team of auditors will look at Springfield's bilingual program to see if it is succeeding. Meanwhile, state lawmakers are also looking at bilingual ed. There is some talk about shortening the time frame. It shouldn't be K through 12. You should be able to go into bilingual education, move out after a few years. I think the ballot initiative is a little too harsh, however. And in the north end of Springfield, some thought English first is best. It's better for them to learn English first because it's a lot of opportunity for them. While others said it should be English with other subjects taught in Spanish. They should learn both at the same time. I think, the way we did years ago. Of course, bilingual ed offered in Spanish and Vietnamese and other languages as well. Backers of bilingual ed say that the program needs to be updated and not scrapped. Nearly 38,000 students were enrolled in bilingual education programs in the Bay State last year. Back to you. You're watching the Associated Press News Station of the Year. Now, coverage you can count on. This is News 
Center 5. That bilingual education does not work, that English immersion does work. A crusader against bilingual education brings his campaign to Massachusetts. Why he thinks it's a failure. Third rail issue. Politicians, self-interested politicians don't want to touch it. Coming up next, the debate over bilingual education. Who might decide its future here in Massachusetts? There was sparring at the State House today over bilingual education. The debate whether to reform it or get rid of it altogether. And in the middle of it all was a California millionaire who helped lead a drive in his state to eliminate bilingual education. He hopes to help achieve the same thing here. Here's New Center 5's Janet Wu. Why don't you let the fire speak on? Any questions from the They held dueling back-to-back -back press conferences. It promises to be a rowdy, expensive ballot fight. As far as this hectoring is concerned, it is rather typical of the hectoring that the legislature has been receiving. I think it's made it very difficult for very uh, thoughtful discussion about this policy. I can assure you that when all of you speak, that none of us will hector you. Ron Unz of California was the focus of both press conferences. The millionaire spent nearly a million dollars to defeat bilingual education in his own state several years ago. He successfully took his fight to Arizona last year. Now he's hoping to do the same in Colorado and Massachusetts. He didn't heckle his opponents, choosing instead to grin them down. Adios, Mr. Unz. We are in the city that fought the Boston Tea Party. Our civil rights are going to be defended to the end. Adios. Today, Unz filed the papers needed to get on next year's statewide ballot. His premise is simple. Bilingual education does not work, that English immersion does work. It's a divisive solution that is against the spirit and the legacy that has made Massachusetts a beacon in education. We need to tell Mr. Unz, thank you for coming, but no thanks. Are you willing to pony up a million dollars? I really would doubt this will be a very expensive campaign. Again, in California, we didn't say no. I really would very much doubt this. On says one reason he thinks it will be cheaper to back a campaign here is because Massachusetts is a much smaller, compact state. Much of the expense is media costs. Meanwhile, Un says he has been in close and frequent contact with John Silber, another longtime opponent of bilingual programs. Un is hoping Silber will help find money for the campaign. Anthony, to you. It's time for the local news leader, the Neighborhood Network News. A California millionaire is trying to scale down bilingual education in Massachusetts. Over the past three years, Ron Unz has given money to successful referendums against bilingual ed in California and Arizona. He wants to replace teaching in a student's first language with a single year of special classes for learning English. With our report is Joe Rowland advocates and I certainly believe that the children of Massachusetts will improve their test scores in the same way if this measure gets on the ballot and passes and I feel strongly that it will. Meet Ron Unz. He led the repeal of bilingual education in California and now he has some allies who want to end it here. Rather typical. As a principal of a public school I have also seen the incredible damage and the stunting of academic growth that one sees when children are taught in their native tongue for too long. Their ballot initiative calls for sheltered English immersion, but bilingual education has its defenders. We have parents and we have student products of bilingual education who believe that the answer is not to end it, but to mend it. In fact, we should launch an initiative to require all children learn more than one language in the city of Boston. My first language is Spanish. My second language is English. My children's first language is English. Their second language is Spanish. There's nothing wrong with knowing more than one language. Unz claims supporters of bilingual education heavily outspent him in California, but he's willing to spend about $200,000 here. Uh, I was impressed with the number of green signs. There was a lot of green uh, out there earlier today. Ron Unz has a lot of green, uh, and he's going to be spending that green. 
that the green Representative Barry Oaks refers to is the millions Ron Unz made in computers. And that's proof Un says that he knows what it takes for economic success. But over the last 20 or 30 years, English has become the world's unofficial international language. The language of science, the language of technology, the language of business, the language people are being taught in some of the best Mexican schools and some of the best European schools. I think they should be taught that same language in American schools. Joe Rowland, Neighborhood Network News. And joining us in the studio is Joe Rowland. Uh, Joe, to begin with, about the man from California, who is he? Ron Owens, um, his opponents, and there were a lot of them there today, they held a dueling press conference, call him eccentric and bizarre. He ran for governor of California, uh, lost to Pete Wilson. He made a lot of money in Silicon Valley and um, went to school locally here at Harvard and he's launched successful anti-bilingual education campaigns in both California and Arizona. He won big in both. Given my sense of the demographics in California and Arizona, and I think California percentage-wise might even, for all I know, have more immigrants than Massachusetts does. If it could win there, we could probably win here. It sure looks like it. Again, he was winning 61% in California, 63% in Arizona. Massachusetts has a lot of first-generation immigrants, but it Given the trend of things blowing across the country, it, it looks good to win here. Different people have different opinions about this issue, uh, but does it work the way uh, Mr. Unz would like to see it done? How uh, successful has it been in California? Un says it works. He claims great improvements, 40% improvements on test scores. He claims converts from leaders of the Bilingual Education Teachers Association. And Unz was actually a moderate in California. As I say, when he ran against Pete Wilson, Wilson had this Prop 187 to deny benefits to illegal immigrants. Unz fought against that, and a lot of Republicans think, geez, we would have been better off if Unz had won rather than Wilson, because Wilson's gotten Republicans in big trouble with Latino voters nationwide. So far, uh, I think he has uh, one Cuban-American, one Italian-American backing him, but I hardly see this, this overwhelming consensus among, let's say, Latino and Asian people that uh, they're flocking to his proposal. Not based on the people he had out there today. He had a uh, principal from Chelsea's public schools and also uh, from BU, which has a role in Chelsea's public schools. Uh, Professor of Political Science who has yes, studied exactly. the issue for a number of years. And some other uh, Latino women who had, uh, another Latino woman from Newton who had written a book on the subject. Right, thank you very much for being with us, Joe. Up ahead, uh, we'll have more news after a look at the weather. Now on WBZ4 News. Should English be the only language in Bay State classrooms? The battle of bilingual education heads to Beacon Hill. This is WBZ TV4, Boston's choice for news and information. You are watching WBZ4 News on Boston's television station. New at 5.30, a battle is brewing over whether the state should end its bilingual education program. As WBZ's Casey Kaufman tells us, a California millionaire says yes and came to Boston today pushing some radical reforms that the parents and the voters of Massachusetts should have a right to decide whether the children of Massachusetts are taught English or whether they are not taught English. He is the Silicon Valley millionaire on a mission to dismantle bilingual education. Juan Unz brought his crusade to Massachusetts today. Under state law in Massachusetts, 49,000 students may enroll in a bilingual program for up to three years. And three years is simply too long for opponents. I have also seen the incredible damage that one sees when children are taught in their native tongue for too long. Supporters of the ballot initiative want to see a one-year English immersion approach like the one in California, where Un spent $700,000 of his own money on a similar ballot initiative. The critics of the ballot initiative are gearing up for a fight, too. The prospect of an unfunded campaign here in Massachusetts has supporters mobilizing. One size fits all does not work. 
the Representative Florida Jared Water. Barrios organized a pro-bilingual education rally today, attended by politicians, parents, and activists. In the case of Mr. Hans, this has nothing to do with good educational policy. It has to do with politics, divisive politics, politics of, politics of hatred. The rhetoric is heating up, and supporters are committed to proving that Massachusetts voters will not follow in California's footsteps. Our civil rights are going to be defended to the end. Adios. The battle lines are drawn in Boston. Casey Kaufman, WBZ, 4 News. Going beyond the headlines now, Massachusetts was the first state in the nation to enact a bilingual education law back in 1971. This allows students with limited knowledge of English up to three years of education in both English and their native language. Good evening, I'm John Carroll filling in for Emily Rooney. Tonight, bilingual education in Massachusetts comes under fire. Plus, a cranberry farmer gets bogged down in a wetlands dispute and the author of a book on legendary theater critic George Jean Nathan. But first, it's a debate that simmered in the Commonwealth for over 30 years, namely how the state can best educate its bilingual children. That debate was played out at the State House today. On one side, California millionaire Ron Unz, who led successful ballot campaigns to eliminate traditional bilingual programs in California and Arizona, and came to Boston today to do the same for Massachusetts. On the other side, critics who say the proposal is anti-children and anti-immigrant. The bilingual education battle took center stage at the State House today, with both sides out swinging over a potentially divisive ballot campaign. I certainly believe that the children of Massachusetts will improve their test scores in the same way if this measure gets on the ballot and passes. California millionaire Ron Unz came to the Commonwealth to announce his support for a ballot question aimed at replacing the current bilingual teaching system with a new one, namely a one-year, all-or-nothing English immersion curriculum. Opponents say forcing immigrant children into English-only classes could hurt their ability to learn. The good citizens of Massachusetts will see this referendum and they will see Mr. Hines for what it is. It's nothing more than divisive politics. It's nothing to do with really educating children. Legislators on both sides are jumping in to reform the system, like Representative Antonio Cabral, who is proposing a modified bilingual education program where non-native and native English speakers are taught in the same classroom. The main objective or the main goal of TVE is to teach English but utilizing the strength of that student which is his home language for him or her to continue their academic development on math, science, social studies, history so when they move from when they finally transition to mainstream they are not three to five years behind. Senator Guy Glottis, who supports the ballot initiative, has proposed a bill similar to the California proposition that ended bilingual education, and Glottis says in California, it's working. Since that bill has been incorporated in California, test scores have gone up 20, 50, and sometimes 100% for bilingual students. Teachers like third grade bilingual teacher Mary Guerrero say a single bilingual education program doesn't necessarily benefit all kids. Different students respond well to different programs. It's not like it's one size fits all when it comes to bilingual education, just like it is for any type of education. And when it really comes down to it, all sides say, it's about getting bilingual students to learn. When I write a uh, word like it's not supposed to be, they, they correct it for me, and I read it, and now and I go like, oh, now I understand. And with me now are Ron Unz, the National Chairman of English for Children, Kathleen Dawson, a teacher at Charlestown High School, and Representative Jared Barrios of Cambridge, who opposes the ballot initiative and supports a modified version of the current system. Ron, um, let me start with you, uh, since you're our guest here in Massachusetts. Um, you've been successful in California, uh, Arizona. You've, I think you've got an in initiative going in Colorado. Why Massachusetts? Why, why here? Are we that bad off here? Well, yeah, I mean, from all the reports I've read, the bilingual programs here are just as bad as the ones in California and Arizona and these other states. Furthermore, Massachusetts was the first state in America 30 years ago 
to establish a statewide bilingual education mandate. It's been copied by many other states. And getting rid of the program here, I think, would have huge national implications. Mm, it's like knocking off uh, a Kennedy for the Republicans. <laughs> um, le let, me, uh, let me ask you this. The, how would this work, the, the immersion program? A student goes into a class with all the other students, takes English classes in English, takes math classes in English, takes science classes in English? Well, it's a little bit complicated. I mean, the vast majority of the immigrant students we're talking about were born in the United States or came here when they're very young. We're talking about students who enter school when they're generally five or six years old. At that age, under this initiative, they would be placed in a short-term, intensive, sheltered English immersion program for a few months or a year to teach them English as quickly as possible. Once they learned English, they would be moved into regular classes with all the other students. Mm -hmm. It sounds like um, this would be a good program. We have, we have a situation here where uh, the uh, ch students in the bilingual education classes, according to critics, are, have the lowest MCAS scores, have the lowest college acceptance, have the highest dropout rates. Why not give them this sort of crash course and then move them right into the mainstream? Um, I assume you're directing that to I'm me. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. Representative Barrios, yes, I'm sorry. Um, it's, I guess it's very simple. You're absolutely right. And uh, Mr. Unce is correct when he says we have to do something for bilingual children. Um, he's incorrect when he says it's complicated, uh, or at least his proposal is complicated. It's very simple. One year, sink or swim. And in the same way that the current law is flawed, our current law, the transitional bilingual education, is flawed because it's only one program that school districts are allowed to administer, Mr. Unce's program is flawed because just like the current law, it's one size fits all. Children come in different, uh, in different uh, sizes, shapes, and colors. Most importantly, children who enter our schools come here at different ages. Mr. Unce is right. Young children, five or six, can be immersed uh, very successfully at early ages. Children who come here at later ages, the mind works differently. You acquire language at a different rate at that time. And immersion is not the most appropriate way. So why tie the hands of a school district? Why not let school districts have a variety of programs? What I've been proposing, and we've been able to get a lot of folks on board, uh, is a compromise, something which allows different types of programs for different types of students. Another point I want to make uh, is separate from the age difference, that children come from different countries with vastly different educational experiences. Mm -hmm. We have a child in my district who just came from Switzerland. Now that child uh, speaks German and French and is now learning English. Mm -hmm. That child is at grade level in science, social studies, uh, and math. Certainly another child there's, there's a disparity. Another there's child no comes question. another child right. comes from El Salvador, the same age, mm -hmm. uh, but with bare literacy in their native language of Spanish. Those two children shouldn't be treated mm -hmm. the same way. And one size fits all, whether it's Mr. Runce's or the current law does that. Mm -hmm. That's not right. Kathleen Dawson, let me let me ask you, you had an, an English immersion program, did you not, when uh, when you were in school? Or when did you I, have experience with them? Yes, uh -huh. and I was in a total immersion program. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I think there is a difference as far as age, because I did come at it an early age. But the one disadvantage of that, as where I learned English and, you know, ex ex um, excelled in English, I lost my language. And I, I feel that that was a vi very crucial loss for me culturally um, in my confidence as well. But just the whole idea that um, I couldn't keep my language, mm -hmm. I think, was a loss for me intellectually. This is, this is one of the objections, uh, Ron. And, and, and another objection is that this is all very Darwinian, that it's, that it's a sort of survival of the fittest. And if you don't make it uh, when you get tossed into the mainstream, then, um, then you've pretty much lost your chance. What's, yeah. what's the, uh, the, the accommodation for that? The thing is, you have to look at the details of the initiative. The initiative doesn't say that all students have to be put in English immersion programs. It allows exception waivers. So for example, especially for older students who might actually benefit from a bilingual program, their parents can apply for a waiver to put them in a bilingual program. Mm -hmm. It also indicates that if a child requires more time in the immer immersion program before ma being mainstreamed, that's fine also. In other words, most children, especially five or six year olds, probably a few months or at most a year is enough. Other children, maybe a little bit older, might require a year and a half or even two years, and that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. I actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to just, uh, this, the problem with what Mr. Arns is saying is that it may work in theory, uh, mm -hmm. but reality, you know, this uh, Pollyanna theory is nice, but reality says 
But a school district, which is not required to offer anything, when a parent goes for a waiver, they're going to find, well, there's nothing for them to waive into. Mm -hmm. uh, and school districts that are for having to do Prop 2 and a half overrides and making hard decisions on money aren't going to have people waiting around for these parents. The reality is his program is not going to allow children, especially older children, to succeed. They're going to drop out. And in that sense, it's anti-child and it's anti-immigrant. Well, Kathleen, you've been on the ground. You, you know the reality of this. What works in a classroom? Um, well, I know that as a math teacher, I can't teach them the content if they don't understand the English. And I do understand that you know, students could get a waiver if they're at the high school level. But that, to me, then sounds like it's a compromised program, meaning that there's many op options according to the student's needs. And when you say, you know, students at a young age could be immersed in the program, what I'm concerned about is even when they're five and six, if they're totally immersed in an English um, program, my question is then what's happening to the rest of their content development? Is that being taught via their language, home language, or through English, and how? I mean, again, yeah, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and the, the point that Representative made about whether this program would work well in theory but not in practice is an interesting one. But it has worked in California. In other words, when the initiative was on the ballot a few years ago in California, many of these same arguments were made against it. It still passed overwhelmingly. And the results are that the test scores of over a million immigrant children in California have gone up by an average of 40% in less than two years. Mm -hmm. And that includes those districts which have resisted implementing the initiative. Those districts that have most strictly and completely complied with the measure, gotten rid of all their bilingual programs, have doubled their test scores in less than two years. And in particular, an individual who was superintendent of one of those districts who had been for 30 years a supporter of bilingual education, who opposed the initiative but implemented, said his children's success convinced him. And he now is a born-again convert to English immersion. He admits he was wrong for 30 years. And he was the founder of the California Association of Bilingual Educators. Mm -hmm. in, in Representative Barrios, I last, last I word. It's very important to note that our own State Department of Education looked at Mr. Ernst's statistics and thoroughly discredited them. What they found was it has not been in effect long enough to know. And importantly, uh, some of the numbers, numbers playing, I guess they kind of concluded were fuzzy math. I don't disagree. We need to commit more resources. We need to give more choices uh, to these children. One size fits all. Replacing another one size fits all is not the answer. Okay. Well, this I think I'm sorry, Kevin. This I, this is going to rage on for a while, especially if it goes on the ballot. So we'll be revisiting it. Representative Jared Barrios, Kathleen Dawson, Ron Arms, thanks very much for being here. And when we continue, a local cranberry farmer says the EPA is all wet. Now, Margie Reedy, Chet Curtis, this is Newsnight on NECN. We don't need to have little children learning every subject in Spanish, and when they graduate, what do they do? They don't know English, and they're living here. In any language, the message is clear. Massachusetts faces a ballot test of bilingual education. Are students from diverse cultures falling behind for lack of basic English skills? Well, it's incredibly exciting for me because it, it's a validation of my life's work. Also tonight, the doctor who waited 30 years to have his day, Kilmer McCulley, opens new frontiers in understanding and preventing heart disease. Good evening, I'm Chet Curtis. Margie Reedy will be away until mid-August. He's a medical detective whose persistence nearly cost him his career. Now, Kilmer McCulley wants to change the way you think about your diet and your heart. He'll be my guest later here on Newsnight. Also tonight, I'll lead a frank discussion of learning disabilities, including a panel from the famous Landmark School, and some thoughts from actress Angelica Houston. But first, Massachusetts is facing a battle over language and literacy, cultural identity, and getting ahead the American way. On the steps of the State House today, supporters of traditional bilingual education fought back against a ballot drive for so-called English immersion. NECN's Allison King has the story. In 1971, Massachusetts became the first state in the country to pass a bilingual education law. Thirty years later, nearly 50,000 students take part in the state's bilingual education program, which has students with limited English skills learn math, science, and other subjects in their native tongue for up to three years. But the bilingual education program will soon be abolished if Ron Unz has his way. 
Unz is a California millionaire who spent more than $700,000 of his own money to wipe out bilingual education programs in California and Arizona through a ballot initiative. Massachusetts is his next target. The parents and the voters of Massachusetts should have a right to decide whether the children of Massachusetts are taught English or whether they are not taught English. Unz held a news conference to plug his ballot initiative before Wednesday's deadline to file paperwork for the 2002 election. We don't need to have little children learning every subject in Spanish, and when they graduate, what do they do? They know no English, and they're living here. Unz was joined by parents and educators, including Chelsea High School Principal Lincoln Tamayo, who chairs the State Education Department's Bilingual Advisory Board. The Cuban native says he's decided to lead Unz's Massachusetts campaign based on his own experience when he started kindergarten in the United States not knowing a word of English. By October of my kindergarten year, I spoke English perfectly. And by the end of that year, I can read quite well. Unz's proposal would put all non-English speakers in a one-year immersion class where they would learn in English with other immigrants. Waivers would be granted for some older and special needs kids. Opponents say that plan would be a disaster. The answer is not to end it, but to mend it. Cambridge Representative Jarrett Barrio says the current system is in need of a change, but not the drastic one that Unz is recommending. The problem with Ron Unz is that he wants to get rid of a one-size-fits-all program and replace it with another one-size-fits-all solution. One size does not fit all. Barrios was joined by a coalition of state reps, bilingual educators, and activists to protest Unz's visit to Massachusetts. I have one word for Ron Unz. Adios. Now it's going to take more than that to get Ron Unz to back off. He's already spent more than $700,000 of his own money for a win in California. And while he says he has no plans to spend any of his own money here in Massachusetts, he also would not rule out the possibility. At the Massachusetts State House, I'm Allison King, NECN. Well, my guests in studio tonight are well-armed for the battle over bilingual education. Ron Unz from the group English for the Children is the activist who led the successful drive for English immersion instruction in California. And Jared Barrios is the Democratic State Representative from Cambridge who wants to reform, not replace, bilingual education. Welcome and thank you both for being here. Ron, let me start with you. Why did you bring this campaign to Massachusetts? Well, Massachusetts is the first state in America which established a mandatory bilingual education program. There have been many attempts over the last 15 or 20 years by governors and legislators to modify or reform that program. All have failed. Nothing has happened in 30 years. The program is a disaster. And I think the children in Massachusetts, the immigrant children in Massachusetts, are better off if they're taught English in school. So you're for total elimination, not for modifying it as representative. Well, I wouldn't say total el elimination. There are waivers, there are options in the initiative. But by and large, if the initiative passes, the number of students in bilingual education will probably fall by 95 or 98 percent. Representative Barrios, if it is true that uh, the students in bilingual education classes have the lowest MCAS scores, the highest dropout rates, mm -hmm. and, the low, and the lowest college admission rate, mm -hmm. why not change it or get rid of it? Well, you know, I actually believe it, we do need to change it. Uh, but I don't think by going to the system that we had 30 years ago, where the kids just dropped out, uh, because especially the older children coming into our system were forced uh, to learn English in a year, didn't, and then dropped out. I don't think that's the way to go. We've learned a lot in the last 30 years about how children acquire language. We have some programs which sort of exist in the shadow of the law in Framingham and Cambridge and Salem, which are producing kids with great test scores. Why not adopt alternatives to the current law and give schools choices, not eliminate the whole thing? I think that it's disingenuous for someone to say, you know, we care about these kids. We want to give them an opportunity to learn English and talk only about the kids who start here when they're five years old. Yes, children who are five can learn English very rapidly, and they should be in rapid immersion programs. But if you come here when you're 13 or 14, you don't learn English as fast. They need a different kind of program. One what size fits all can't be the answer. What about that argument? I agree 100%, and I'd be the first one to admit that for older children, there might be a valid need for bilingual programs, and that's why our initiative distinguishes between children who are 10 and older and younger children. The thing to bear in mind, though, is that over half of all the limited English children in Massachusetts and the rest of the country were born in America. They were born right here. 
Most of the remainder came here when they were very young, so that the vast, vast majority of these limited English students start school when they're just five or six years old. I think at that age, it's very easy for them to learn English. The reason they're still classified as limited English when they're 12 and 13 or 14 is in most cases, the schools have taught them no English for all the years they've been in Plus American schools. they don't schools. have the let's, support let's, at home either. This is, this is a very important point, but it's also important to get your facts straight. Uh, and Mr. Ernst, I think it's important to remember that 80% of children in a current program are out of their program in three years. So while there are certainly exceptions, children who are still there and we need to reform it for those kids, most children are out of TBE and in a mainstream classroom entirely in English in three years' time. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need to change it. And for those kids who are five, six, seven, why not give them an option to do something else in the current law? I'm all for that. We don't need a ballot referendum to do that. Chuck. Well, why three years if you can do it in one year? Well, no, I, I agree. Alternatives, let's make that legal. But you don't need a ballot referendum to do that when we're trying to do that through the legislative process. And I'll tell you this, when you're 12 or 13, you don't learn it in one year. What happens is the kid sticks around for two or three years, doesn't succeed, and they drop out. And his test scores don't count all those kids who are dropping out. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, Ron Unz argues that in California, since they eliminated uh, bilingual education, test scores have gone up dramatically. That's a, that's a really well, good point. Well, let's let him I'll respond just to explain. that. Uh, yeah, during the period of time when we were moving our initiative forward in California, the defenders of bilingual education in California refused to defend that system. They admitted the existing system had a lot of problems, just like the representative is admitting that Massachusetts system had a lot of problems. They said the initiative would simply be much worse. They said it would be disaster. They said test scores would plummet. Instead, the average mean percentile test score of over a million immigrant students in California have risen by 40% in less than two years. That's a huge rise, and that includes those districts that tried to keep their bilingual programs that showed little, if any, gain. Those districts that got rid of all their bilingual programs have doubled their test scores in less than two years. Don't believe me. Believe the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal. Everyone who's looked at the facts admit a gigantic rise in test score has taken place. You know, uh, I was really right, interested right? in that claim, Chet, when uh, Mr. Unce and others made it. And there have been studies that have shown differing results. Some that the scores have gone down, some that the scores have gone up. Our State Department of Education did a study of Mr. Unce's uh, ballot referendum and its results in California and concluded that it's fuzzy math. That is to say, it concluded that it's too early to tell. It's only been in effect a year or two, and that we can't conclude anything. Well, and that's, about really that, that's not a very long time. A well, so, I, I agree. Commit. I agree. Certainly in the long run, we have to look at the results. In fact, the third year's test scores are coming out in two weeks. So in two weeks, there will be three years' worth of test scores. The point is this, though. A 40% rise in the test scores of a million students in a state is a gigantic result to happen that quickly. And by the way, in terms of the Department of Education, we're talking about the bilingual education section of the Massachusetts Department of Education, which is staffed by bilingual advocates who've supported these bilingual programs for 30 years. I mean, Are um, they going to turn around and make the program? I want to respond to that, Chet, because sure, under Ed Reform, there were, they actually eliminated the bilingual education department. I'm not sure how it works in California. They didn't eliminate starts. the people. There are, there are nobody, there's nobody who works full-time in our Department of Education on bilingual issues. In fact, the person who did a study, Sandra Stotsky, is an avowed opponent of bilingual education. Right, I think that speaks volumes to this supposed increases in California. We need to take a break. When you boil it down, is this debate all about America as a melting pot? That's next when Newsnight continues. The story of immigrants is an essential part of the story of America. Now, just as they did in the early 20th century, America is undergoing a new wave of immigration, Asians and Africans, Latinos and Europeans. The new populations come here from dozens of cultures. Do they become American by sharing just one language, Ron? Well, I think they certainly do, and more importantly, they want their children to learn English. Now, the truth is, English is not now and never has been America's official national language. However, in the last 20 or 30 years, English has become the entire world's unofficial international language. It's the language of science, the language of technology, the language of business. Children growing up in Mexico, in Europe, in Asia are all being taught English in their own schools at a young age. I think it's ridiculous that children in Mexico are being taught English and not children in Massachusetts. You know, he's absolutely right. And what's disingenuous about his movement is to say that people like me 
don't want their children to learn English. I want my child, I want everybody's child to learn beautiful English. What I do, what I want though, is for every child to have that educational opportunity. Not that just the five-year-old and his one-size-fits-all plan, but the 12 or the 13-year-old who comes here from El Salvador or Switzerland to also have a chance to learn English. What Ron Unz's plan does is it says, well, for the older kids, we'll forget about them and we'll focus on the young ones. I don't think we can afford to let any child uh, leave any child behind, Chad. Now, in California, do the older kids, uh, how long on average are they taking now if, when you make an exception well, to them in one year? Again, it course. depends in terms of classification criteria. The main point is most of these students seem to be able to handle regular schoolwork in English within a few months if they're young. If they're older students, then as the initiative in Massachusetts and the initiative in California both allowed, their parents can get waivers to place or keep them in bilingual programs. So in other words, a lot of the older students who lost the opportunity to easily learn English when they were young, ended up unfortunately staying in some of those bad bilingual right. programs. You know, numbers involved this, this, this is a real, yeah. This is a really interesting point, this idea of waivers. The, the problem, Chet, with what he's saying, and maybe it's just because he's drafting it for a California legislature and not for a Massachusetts school system, is that Massachusetts school systems will not have programs for those students to waive into. Many school districts, unlike California, where you have hundreds of thousands of kids, we have much smaller school districts in Massachusetts. And when a parent says, well, I'd like my child to stay on another year, there's not going to be anything for them well, to go to, to. You can change the law to do it, though. Well, well no, because, I mean, the, under the current law, which is much stricter than his, there are programs which are, people are entitled to but are not made available by school districts. But isn't it true that, that and I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but a number of students in the current bilingual education program stay in it for four, five, and six years. Actually, actually the facts are 80% of kids are out after three years. Now, I don't want to defend for you, to, but I don't want you to perceive this as a defense of the status quo. We need to change the current law because it only allows one type of program. We need to allow two-way immersion. We need to allow structured immersion, modified structured immersion, and opportunities for school districts to do experimental types of programs. But one right. size fits all, as Mr. Unce would have it, one year, sink or swim, is not the way to go, because we know that older kids don't learn that well, he's quickly. he's not really saying one, one year uh, sink or swim. He's saying there can be exceptions. Well, except that there's, the emperor has no clothes. There's not going to be anything to wave into. Now, is, isn't it true that in, in Boston, for example, that many parents are opting to take their kids out of the bilingual Absolutely. education program and putting them into an immersion Absolutely. program? Which, which argues, frankly, against any ballot referendum. If people already have the right to opt out, why do you need to take it away from them, Ron? Well, to be perfectly honest, it's very difficult to get out of the, some, of the, some of these programs. And some of the parents, for example, supporting our initiative, have to take their children out of the public school system. They have to scrape together the money to send their children to Catholic school or other private schools because the public schools refuse to teach their children English and refuse to let their children out of the program. Well, well is but, there... But, but to be clear, the process is pretty simple. You say, do you want your child in a TBE program or do you want them in a standard program? The parent has... Now, if you don't like the public schools for other reasons, Ron, you know, right. I don't know what to tell you well, about that one. We're almost out of time. Is there, Ron, in, in uh, your judgment, a public will, a popular will in Massachusetts for uh, eliminating bilingual I education? I think a tremendous popular will. In fact, when I did some polling on the issue to see what the sentiment was of ordinary residents here, it was far stronger to get rid of bilingual education than virtually any other place I'd looked at, including California. And this is a real problem, because when you ask a question, do you want your child to learn English instead of keep learning native language, I would answer that question, yes. It's sort of the dishonesty of this entire movement. And in that sense, it's really anti-immigrant and it's really anti-child because you can't afford to leave any child behind, Chet. Well, <laughs> is, is the major opposition coming from bilingual teachers, Jared? Jared? Uh, by, by that you mean? Is the, is the opposition, the major opposition to, to eliminating <laughs> bilingual coming from bilingual Well, I'll teachers. tell you this. I'll tell you this. If you are a thoughtful person, <laughs> and I think most folks who sort of think about how kids learn, when they're younger, they learn quicker, when they're older, uh, it takes them more time. I think you have to be concerned. Uh, and actually, the people I work with are not teachers in the classroom. They're not folks trying to hold on to their jobs. You're, you're chuckling that right. Well, to be perfectly honest, virtually all the opposition to getting rid of bilingual education, both in Massachusetts and other states, comes from what might be called the bilingual education industry. The bilingual teachers, the bilingual administrators, the bilingual coordinators, the bilingual textbook manufacturers, the bilingual academics, and the politicians that they are able to control and influence. Ron, could, could I ask you a question? I, I, I have I to wish. Chet, I need to ask him a question because he's not from around here. Uh, and you do come here from California. You seem to act like you know a lot about what we do in Massachusetts, Ron. Could you 
give me some examples of who you're talking about when you say there's a bilingual industry in Massachusetts? Because I don't know of such a thing. I think Quick that's a sort of, well that that's a poll-tested thing. It's pretty simple. A cynical. lot of the bilingual teachers who showed up at our press conference to denounce us. All right. Well. I'm sorry, I wish we could go on with this. My thanks to Ron Unz and Representative Jared Barrios. Next, a doctor is vindicated and rewrites the script for the fight against heart disease. Kilmer McCulley is my guest when Newsnight returns. public affairs program about some of the major issues facing Massachusetts and the nation. Here for Channel 5 News and Public Affairs, Peter Mahegan. What should we do about bilingual education? There are proposals around to change it, get rid of it, clean it up. We'll be back to talk about it in a moment. If Ron Unz gets his way, you'll be voting in 2002 whether to scrap the present system of bilingual education in Massachusetts. Unz, a wealthy Californian with a Harvard degree, has successfully led anti-bilingual ed initiatives in his home state and in Arizona. He came to Massachusetts this week after finding local people willing to support his plan to allow non-English speaking kids just one year of bilingual ed, followed by enrollment in regular classes. We don't need to have little children learning every subject in Spanish, and when they graduate, what do they do? They don't know English, and they're living here. Bilingual education does not work, that English immersion does work. It's a divisive solution that is against the spirit and the legacy that has made Massachusetts a beacon in education. We need to tell Mr. Ons, thank you for coming, but no thanks. Micho, you have some experience with this, having uh, come to Cuba as a child. Uh, what do you think? Uh, should we be changing this system, which is now a, a big bureaucracy, millions of dollars, or go the old Ellis Island sink or swim, which you did, well, right? I, absolutely. I am a product of immersion. I, I remember distinctly the first day I sat in a classroom and couldn't understand a word anybody was saying, and two years later I was fluent, or I think of myself as fluent. But anyway, uh, so. I, I totally think we need to reform the system, and I think if you poll Hispanic parents, most of them understand that the facts are that these kids are failing the MCAS at two to three times the rate that other kids are so we know there's a problem this is a time when the state is getting ready for the standard these kids aren't going to graduate unless they they uh, learn English by the way and I strongly feel they also should be able to preserve their native tongue because for the 21st century we should be graduating kids who speak two languages at least so it shouldn't be one or the other but immersion should should be part of it well, it, it's hard to argue with what Micho said. She said it so eloquently and so Tries fluently, and I, fluently right. in English, which, which is proof positive that <laughs> it does work. Uh, as for the preservation of, of the, the native tongue, that's fine, and it's up to families to do that, and, and families do it, whether it's... Uh, or schools. Well, but, but it, there's no reason why families can't. They can preserve, preserve ethnicity, religious right. background, whatever it is. It, the, the point is that, is that you have a failing system and therefore it has to be changed. There are some people I know who are second generation and still can't speak the language, speak English uh, well. The other part of it is I noticed the defense for the program as is, the status quo, is coming from all the people who live off the program. All the people who are the bilingual educators or who are administrators or who are, are the people involved with the program. So, of course, they don't want it to change because they're getting public monies to keep well, it. Well, not all of them. The, the, uh, the state legislator, Barrios, is it from, uh, Barrios. from Cambridge, is a, is a leading uh, advocate of, of keeping it as is. Are there, are there not benefits well, from the bilingual ed program? Of course, there are some benefits. But I think that the idea of immersion will work for many, many students, as Micho has put forth. Look, this whole idea of bilingual started back in 1968 with uh, Texas Senator Ralph Yarbrough, Yarbrough doing it for Mexican children coming into Texas. Just as with special ed, when David Bartley was House Speaker in 1976 and they started that, these programs become sacred cows. And then federal dollars follow those programs so that 
there is a tremendous built-in resistance. Any idea to how much we're spending, or how many people work on the bilingual ed uh, apparatus? Well, what's, what's, I mean, we're spending uh, you know millions and millions, but you know, there's, rather than just the education, there is also a cultural problem that goes on. In, in Lowell, for instance, the people from Southeast Asia. They want their youngsters out of that language and into English so that they can get a piece of the good life. They know that success is, uh, is formulated if you speak English only. There's so no, do a lot the, of Hispanic. The, let me just finish, the, finish my point. In the city of Lawrence, it has a Hispanic population. There is more of a clinging to their language, and it is almost a, they see it as some sort of cultural fight to maintain the Hispanic, the Hispanic culture and the language and not taking English in there. Now, the Cuban population in, in, has been very different. In Florida, they have been very willing to get into English. The, his, uh, the Hispanics from Puerto Rico, from the Dominican Republic, have not been. And I we should been, be yeah. teaching that. And I people mean, will deny it, but that's I, the truth. I want to add a couple of things. One is, of course, there should be serious tutoring for those who, for whom immersion does not work. One size does not fit all. I think we need to reform the system, but we can't totally scrap the system. The second is, I think it's a very bad thing to reform it through referendum. I'm hoping the state legislature will, uh, will convene the right um, you know, group to look at this and, and, and pass legislation what kinds that avoids of changes, referendum. What kinds of changes would be indicated in the system if, we well, don't, if it doesn't go to referendum? Well, I think that what, it doesn't have to be that one size fits all, you know, either immersion or the traditional right. bilingual. I think that there are different approaches that should be taken with different children. The other thing is that this, in a political sense, this gets played out as Spanish versus English. But there are, are literally dozens of students with, from other backgrounds, Russian, Chinese, Korean, and so on. The interesting thing was a few years back when the New York Board of Ed looked at uh, bilingual education, they found that Russian and Chinese and Korean students were what they called placing out. In other words, they were going into mainstream English classes very rapidly. Which and is, that, exactly, and which is that, exactly my point. Why? Which says, because why? The, because the, Spa because in Sp the Spanish population uh, in, from many areas view this as their right to speak no, no, Spanish. No, 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 hanging on to exactly. your culture is you can't get a job. You well, get something well, with a lot of... Let me tell you, there's no bank presidents that don't speak English. There's no one who's on the anchor desk who doesn't but speak wait, English. But wait, the economy is... At one point, the economy is changing and there are few people who can get a hired in a lot of banks these days who don't speak two languages. But is English one of them? Yeah, of course, of course. But, but, the, but the Hispanics have clung to it in defense of the Hispanics because of volume. They are able to be. If you're one of three kids in a school of 5,000 who speaks a language, of course you're going to be right. a bilingual. When you've got as many Hispanics as you do, then it's easier to cling to it. Yeah, there, are, like there, are about, there are about 69 right. languages, uh, according right. to the Education Department, spoken in, in, the, in, in uh, Massachusetts. And while you talk about uh, bilingualism, any place where bilingualism is really in existence has caused enormous problems. Look at Montreal, the province of Quebec and Canada with French and, and, uh, and English. The, if this is going to be a country where English is spoken, and if you want your child to succeed, you really do need to get that person to speak English. And as for this one size fits all, or let's tailor make it, there are 50,000 kids in bilingual education. You can't tailor make that program. The Ellis Island experience, where millions of immigrants came over and they learned the language, is probably the best model we had that was far more successful than I, any I bilingual education. I agree with education. you, but I think we're the only country in the world that is still monocultural, and we're changing well, fast. We're monocultural. We I have all kinds of Monolingual, excuse me, monolingual. And I think it's very important that we recognize which mo most... I know, I go to, I, 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 when I go over to England, I, I go to England, they seem to be speaking English. No, but they also like speak a lot of other Me, languages. Micho's point that she raised in the very beginning of this segment was that this is the 21st century. In a global economy, we want our students to be speaking two languages at one least. One of them ought to be English. Yes. Yeah. Buyers yes. can buy anywhere right, in right. their own language. A seller has to be able to speak the language of his customers. Right. It may so, be, but the right. first language they ought to know is English. No, we're and we're, talk we're, we're talking about how to get them to speak English quickly, and then they can learn what's going on. Where is this fellow on? He was successful in California. He was successful in Arizona. Well, well, one well, of the I, 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 success, I, I, is, he, is he going to be successful here? And he well, you know something? I out. think if they continue the fight in the method that they have, the advocates, by uh, labeling him as a racist just because he believes something that about 80% of the population believes, he will be successful. In both, in both California and Arizona passed with over 60% of the vote. 
And by the way, when you lament that this is being done by referendum, everybody always laments that. You know why we have to turn to the referendum? Because the legislature isn't doing its job. That's right. And, and this and other places. Uh, interestingly, in California, where it has been successful and they've had a tremendous increase, 40% increase in their test scores since they went to the emergent system, there are also 188,000 waivers that are granted. Right so that kids who just can't cut it and, in immersion and, and can have know, something this, else. This has become a way to, to segregate a lot of, of kids away from the mainstream in the That's schools, right. and they'll be much happier socially if they're part of the mainstream. Okay, what about paid family leave? Should everyone have the same benefits that Governor Swift has? Back in a moment. continue a decades-old debate with renewed enthusiasm, bilingual ed in public schools. That's our Eye on Education. In our Eye on Education series tonight, John Carroll takes a new look at an old debate. How much time and resource should be spent on bilingual education? Two Hispanic educators from the same city have two very different points of view. Graciela Tria is a Medford assistant principal. She's Puerto Rican but was raised in New York where she was educated solely in English. That spelled disaster when it came to communicating with her Latino family. You, you realize very quickly you, you not only are beneath the thought processes of, of just your regular normal people but it, to a great extent you've begun to shut some doors to your opportunity with, with that community. Miles away in Lawrence is Tria's former school district where 82% of students are non-native English speakers. Wilfredo Laboy, the Lawrence superintendent, is also Puerto Rican and was also raised in New York. In 1974, 1975, in New York City Public Schools, uh, uh, you could I would have cut my, my, my wrists and poured out my blood for bilingual education. But times have changed, and this is where Laboy and Tria part ways. LaBoy believes that after 30 years, bilingual education in Massachusetts has failed. He points to a reading test he gave students last year as proof. The, the bilingual kids just bombed out. Uh, I mean, fourth graders, not one child was reading on or above grade. Uh, sixth grade, not one child was reading on or above grade. The results are similar statewide. MCAS scores released this month showed 43% of limited English fourth graders failing the English exam. That's more than regular students and students with disabilities combined. 53% of limited English fourth graders failed the math portion. So this year, LeBoy has overhauled his bilingual education program. Students in kindergarten through second grade are being taught by English immersion. The restructuring immersion is not a sink and swim, but it's a language acquisition, 80 or 90% in English, with a Spanish professional, paraprofessional, in the classroom, helping children clarify ideas in their native language. Name the most abundant. Okay, do we all know what the word abundant means? Yes. Very good. I think every single child in this country that does not have English, cannot compete in the language, of power and culture and enterprise and in and, 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 and this country is at a tremendous disadvantage. This is about a moral and professional responsibility. Graciela Tria couldn't disagree more. Responsibility, she says, means committing the resources to educate bilingual students both ways, in English and their native language. What's more, she says, bilingual education actually enhances learning. Higher levels of English proficiency are gained and higher levels of academic achievement are gained. We know that when a strong foundation has been established in the native language. In fact, Tria wants more time spent in bilingual programs, not less, as she explains with a bit of creative math. A five-year-old child, in order to function in English, not having uh, proficiency, fluent proficiency at eight, age five, would need to do the equivalent of 15 months learning in a 10-month period for a period of five years at the very least. 
anything less is statistically improbable. But with the national attitude toward bilingual education increasingly negative, Tria will be lucky to hold her ground, never mind gain any. Okay, and with me now are Representative Jarrett Barrios of Cambridge, who supports bilingual programs and would offer choices to parents, and Lincoln Tamayo of English for the Children of Massachusetts, who supports the idea of one-year immersion programs. Jared Barrios, we've been having this debate for decades now. Is it not, has not the time come to try something different? Absolutely. Completely different. What's, and I guess I'm going to say, what is wrong with the immersion program? Absolutely. The, the current law... Uh, is a one-size-fits-all solution, transitional bilingual education. Children from different ages have the same program. Now you might ask, why am I criticizing this current law? I'm criticizing it for the same reason I criticize this ballot initiative that this gentleman, the millionaire from California, is coming to Massachusetts with. He's saying, instead of transitional bilingual education, we have to have a one-size-fits-all, one-year sink-or-swim program. The reality is, children at different ages learn differently. So give the schools the flexibility to have mm -hmm. different kinds of programs that he meet their needs. He points to huge successes. Well, actually... Uh, this, um, is the, this is um, the, the Pop, yes. Pop 227 guy in California. He points to huge successes in standardized testing and says, we have the proof that the, the first, year. first year immersion program works. The first year his test scores went up, the second year they came down. Interesting point that he made was that in the second year, he said, well, some of my success stories have, are no longer considered limited English students because they're now in regular programs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same case as you saw with our MCAS scores. If a, the 43% of children who failed the MCAS or who passed the MCAS in English, next year they're not going to be in that program. By definition, children who are performing poorly um, are going to be the ones in those programs. Okay. Um, I, just, I, I know there is, there is uh, legislation on the... On Beacon Hill, and there's also a ballot initiative, and I don't really want to get into the nuances of both. So I just want to sort of stick to the, Mr. Twanner, your, your, what is your position on, on the immersion program? Why are you convinced? I know you were with the Chelsea schools for a year. Why are you convinced that's the better way to go? I am convinced uh, from my own experiences, uh, having immigrated here from Cuba. Uh, when I uh, began kindergarten at the age of five, I could not speak a stitch of English. By October of my kindergarten year, I could speak very well. I could begin to read quite well by the end of my kindergarten year. I don't think that I've been in, uh, endowed with a brain that is much different than the brains of five-year-old children now in Chelsea and in Lawrence and in Springfield. Those children uh, should be allowed to immerse themselves in English and to gain proficiency very quickly. What we have in place now is a law that assumes that the children are not capable of learning English as quickly as possible. Mr. Barrios, by the way, is completely wrong on the results out of California. In fact, the uh, uh, limited English proficient students out of, out of the Oceanside District not only caught up with their limited English proficient uh, peers in California, but they overtook them and overtook uh, every other a district that has uh, shown uh, to stay with bilingual education. Okay. They've done far better. At, why not try it? Since we've well, seen by the results see, of the MCAS test, this is, the other system this is isn't working. He, almost, he admits the failure of his own program. What, what he would like to do, and what Ron Unce would like to do, is say, we're going to scrap the current program and make everybody, children of all ages, do the same program. Now, for immersion works for five-year-olds. It worked yeah. for Mr. Tamayo quite well. But if you come here at the age of 13 or 14, it's going to because younger children learn language quicker, the, sort of the flip of that is, if you're older, it takes you but, a little but, but bit wait longer. wait a second. First of all, why is this largely about the, his, wait, 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 why is this largely about the Hispanic community? I've seen profiles, well, many, many, in the last year this about, is about the people Hispanic from community. Kosovo, people from Albania, people who have come here and not speaking a word, and they are valedictorians. Let, and me, let me answer that, Emily, because the reality is, in Massachusetts, if you look at ESL kids, and that's the equivalent of what they're putting um, they'll be putting us in ESL kids versus in second language case precisely two-way immersion kids and TBE kids. These are the kids, their programs. The kids who do best are the kids in flexible programs. The one-size-fits-all programs, whether it's the current law or what he's proposing for all children, do work. Most people don't those are Massachusetts here. People who have come from other countries have had to. Well, why not? Then let's let's give well. school districts choices. Mr. They've Barrios. Done, they've done well in those Mr. programs. Barrios. When a child is immersed in English and they are and they are able to be immersed within a year. At the age of five. Maybe. At the age of, at five, the age of five, five and at the age of at, thirteen wait, and wait. fourteen. And by the way, Mr. Barrios fails to tell you that the initiative allows for waivers for children who are age ten and higher. 
because we understand, and I understand, let me finish, Mr. Barrios, and I understand from my experience in Chelsea that the older you are, the more difficult mm -hmm. it is to pick up a second language. Right. So if you have 20 problem, children within a district the problem where weekend. parents believe that it they need, need to have their children taught in another language, the initiative allows but isn't for that, that way. kind of what you're suggesting? Well, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is what, what they have put in place is sort of it. I want to take the community of Framingham. 92%, 92% of the children in bilingual programs in Framingham passed the MCAS test. English or math. Mm -hmm. English and or math. 92%. In Framingham, they have four or five different programs to meet the needs of different children. Why should we take away a successful program. Why should we deny the city of Framingham, the children of Framingham, the ability to have a good bilingual program what by have, imposing what they have not a one told size you, fits all? What they have not told you Mr. in Tamayo, Framingham. If I could finish now. What they have not if told you in Framingham. Mr. Tamayo, the wait, passing wait, wait, I, I, I want to respond, Mr. Tamayo, because yeah. what we have here is a proposal that would allow only one okay. form. Now, and how does and it, I want to hear how it, it would not be one form. You would take that away from Framingham. And why why yeah. would no. you do that? It's a successful program. The initiative for all, no, the Framingham has not told us what the passing rates are by program. I'll tell you this, every child in their program went on to uh, higher education. Every child who was in a bilingual education at the high school, Framingham High School, mm -hmm. went on to as an associate's degree program. First, unfortunately, we are talking about Framingham as opposed to Boston, and the problem we're, really is... We're talking my, about my a point total is of 200 looking children for in Framingham. If we're looking for solutions, in Framingham. one size fits all, okay. whether the current law or the And all I'm going to say to you is, law. one more time, why not give this a try? We've well, tried it the other way. I'm willing to I'm willing to experiment, We've tried it but not for the just last with one 15 size. years with the legislature. I think that choice. And all the legislature needs are busloads of very loud, vocal, organized advocates. Okay, which is going to come first? I'd like to respond. We're going to wait a minute. I'd what's like what's going to come first, the legislation or the ballot well, initiative? We're, we're, the legislation. We're going to have choice legislation this year. Which may not pass. Legislature. Mm -hmm. let, 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 let me tell you a little bit about uh, Mr. Barrios's choice actually, legislation. Actually, I'd like to hear about Mr. Barrios. We haven't released it yet. Mr. Barrios. Uh, it indicates with his legislation and with his initiative, by the way, that if a district wishes to remain in transitional bilingual education, they may do so with no penalty whatsoever. That is that is the price of choice, isn't it, Mr. Tamayo? Mm -hmm. And in a choice the system, price, the, if right, I can, you're going to get price of failure for the last 30 word. years, Mr. Barrios. Word. All right. The last word is this, Emily. If we have successes and we have failures in a choice system, what are we going to push for? We're going to model our programs on those that are successful. Why limit? Why limit ourselves to one program or the other? Well, their point and is why should children too. Because that, that's in correct. the large and districts so let's, with let's large give numbers of Spanish-speaking children, and we have idea. failed for Jared 30 Barrios years. Thank you very much. And Lincoln tomorrow. Thank you very much. The, the debate goes on, and we can see why it's been going for two decades. All right. From the studios of WBZ4 in Boston, you're watching Boston's Choice for New and information. This is WBZ4 News at 7 o'clock on UPN 38. There are new developments in the state's battle over bilingual education. A group which wants to put an end to bilingual education says it's collected more than 100,000 signatures in an effort to place the proposal on the election ballot next year. Critics of the current law want to change, so children who are not fluent in English will be placed in intensive language classes. Massachusetts was the first state in the nation to enact a bilingual education law back in 1971. Broadcast Center. This is 22 News at 5. Well, the future of bilingual education in the Bay State, a little more uncertain tonight. More than 100,000 signatures have been gathered in an effort to dismantle the state's system of bilingual ed. If election officials certify at least 57,000 of those signatures, that measure goes to the state legislature in January. The measure would require bilingual children to be placed in intensive language classes aimed at teaching them English first within a year. If that's rejected by the legislature, another 9,500 signatures would be needed, and that would get it on the November 2002 ballot. Now on WBZ4 News.
A group opposed to the state's bilingual education law claims it is making headway in getting the law eliminated. Members say they've collected more than 100,000 signatures to get the proposal on next year's ballot. Critics of the current law want to change to put children in intensive language classes if the students are not fluent in English. Massachusetts was the first state in the nation to enact a bilingual education law back in 1971. News 40, awarded News Station of the Year by the Associated Press. With coverage you can count on, this is News 40 Nightcast. Improving MCAS test scores is one of the many priorities topping the list of the new superintendent of schools in Holyoke. In his first day on the job, Dr. Eduardo Carballo spoke out on a number of items at tonight's school committee meeting. News 40's Catherine Shepherdson has more on his hope for change. Concerns together on paper comes to our next finance meeting. We can address these Eduardo Carballo comes uh, to the paper city from eastern Massachusetts, where he was an assistant superintendent in the Lawrence school system. He's already made history in Holyoke as the city's first Hispanic school superintendent, and he says he's ready to make his mark, beginning with an aggressive stance on MCAS. I notice that our math scores are not as strong as they should be, and so that's going to be one of my priorities, to see if I can get some additional uh, teaching time and additional instructional support for our students so they can do a better job. That includes developing strong skills in reading and writing in English. Carballo says he's seen students climb the charts using English immersion, a program he wants to expand in the school district. The state expects us to have everybody reading and writing in English by the third grade. If you begin in the first grade, no matter what country you came from, or whether or not you're a second language learner, you have to perform. And so I want to make sure that we're, we're strong and we're, we're supportive. Um, I want to make sure people also understand that we're not going to let those children sink or swim. But Carballo admits one of the toughest challenges will be finding ways to do more while working within a limited budget. As you know, we have some things that are going to impact us, including the, uh, um, uh, the charter school. And I really don't know what the uh, pupil participation there will be. Also the fact that the state is uh, uh, most likely to eliminate the... Uh, uh, 636, Chapter 636 funding, which is the racial imbalance funding. Uh, we run our parent information center with that to the tune of almost $700,000. If that money is not available next year, then I have to find a place in the budget to, uh, to absorb that, and that's going to be a good size hit. Overall, Carballo says his main objective will be to support the success of Holyoke students using what he calls a fair and direct approach to learning. Carballo replaces former Superintendent James McDonald, who retired last June. Live in the studio, Katherine Shepherdson, News 40. From NECN, New England's only 24-hour news channel, this is New England Midday. Coming up next on New England Midday on The Globe at Home, education writer Anand Vaishnav will be here, and we're going to talk about bilingual education in Massachusetts. Now, The Globe at Home on NECN. And on the Globe at Home this afternoon, how should bilingual education be changed in Massachusetts? At the Globe this afternoon, education writer Anand Vaishnav and Massachusetts State Representative Peter Larkin, Pittsfield Democrat, co-chair of the Education Committee in the legislature who's sponsoring one plan to change bilingual, bilingual education. Good afternoon to Anand and Representative Larkin. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Anand, uh, maybe you just tell us you write regularly about education. What basically does the state do now to handle bilingual education for those people who are unfamiliar with it? Right. Well, right now, uh, bilingual education in Massachusetts affects about 39,000 kids. And uh, by law, they're supposed to stay in bilingual education for uh, three years. One of the problems is that they often stay in bilingual education for much longer than that. And that has given rise to a ballot initiative coming up in November, sponsored by a California millionaire, Ron Unz, to basically eliminate bilingual education and replace it with one year of uh, an intense English immersion class. 
and uh, there are a lot of problems uh, with that uh, proposal. So Representative Larkin and Senator Antonioni have come up with uh, what they say is a solution to uh, kind of reforming bilingual education in the state. Mm -hmm. And Representative, maybe you could just give us the quick outline. Uh, you know, why do you think the change is needed, and what does your plan do? Sure. Uh, bilingual education hasn't been reformed since 1971 when it was first began, so to update that we thought it was important that the legislature take on this, uh, this issue. We have a bill called English Opportunities for All Students in the Commonwealth, and what it does is it sort of is premised on the, uh, the tenets of the Education Reform 93, which is to say to people, uh, provide us a plan, each given, given uh, school district, provide us a plan that uh, has been vetted with the local population and basically give choices to those, those uh, parents and of course those students. And from, from that choice is what we want to do is we want to hold them accountable to the plan that they propose. So we have what we call a choice plan with accountability and hopefully uh, at the end of the day, uh, English proficiency is the goal and academic success at the same time. So Representative, one of the uh, big features about this plan is that you would give parents a choice in terms of what types of bilingual education uh, their student, their child could be under, or you, you'd give districts a choice. Well, yeah. Uh, parents themselves have choices already. Uh -huh. They don't have to be involved in, for example, the current education of, of bilingual students in Massachusetts, which is the Transitional Bilingual Education Program. Uh, what we have done here is we basically ask the superintendents to provide a plan, all right, of which they can choose a number of different uh, methods of providing uh, English proficiencies to their limited English proficient uh, students. Uh, for example, right now, uh, we have, you know, the, the UNS initiative would recommend one size of structured immersion, if you will. Uh, our, our comment to that is that it may make some sense for some uh, young uh, uh, students who have no literacy in their, in their uh, life background, and it may work in that respect, but in some respects we feel that we want to provide choices to, to the communities by way of their, their superintendents. And once they've chosen the, the, the path of educating their limited English proficient students, we want them to hold them accountable to that plan. And that's really sort of the effort here is, at the end of the day, we want to have English proficiency. We have a timeline of this of about three years. Actually, you have to provide uh, English proficiency within two, and if you haven't done that, you have one year of intensive uh, uh, effort underway. Um, one of the uh, problems people point to under the current system is that uh, districts uh, just allow students to stay in bilingual education for much longer than the three-year cap. You, uh, or this bill, would change it to uh, two years plus a third year in case the kid isn't uh, ready or proficient enough to go into English. But are there solid accountability measures under your bill, unlike the current system? Right. Right now, there doesn't seem to be any accounting at all yeah. in terms of people who've gotten into the tra transitional bilingual education program that is currently the Massachusetts law. And what we're saying to people is we need an accounting. We need, for example, an assessment of the student upon when they enter the schoolroom as to where they are both in English proficiency and academic uh, excellence. And then on a quarterly basis, we want to know what progress they make. And at the end of year one and year two, we want to be sure that they're succeeding both, as they say, have English proficiency and academic success. And if you're not making any success after the second year, then it's required that you have an intensive program thereof. Stop to think about it from your own perspective. How many people can walk into a foreign country in one year become uh, proficient in a given language mm -hmm. and academically successful at the same time? We know kids come to school with different needs. And recognizing that continuum of learning, do an accurate assessment, and then hold that school system accountable to the plan that they put in place. Mm -hmm. Representative, would your plan cost more than what the state does right now? And if so, how, how would you pay for it? Well, we recognize that there are some costs to doing a program a little bit better than we're doing now. Uh, Massachusetts right now spends upwards of $6 billion on the education of our students in, in, our, in the schools now. Uh, we're spending $50 million alone on what they call MCAS remediation. This plan requires that $12 million probably be allocated relative to what we spend in the, in the Chapter 70 formula for bilingual or, or limited English proficient students. Uh, frankly, it's a way to... More than what is currently spent. Uh, as I say, Massachusetts spends through their Chapter 70 formulation, so each given district spends the appropriate amount of money that they deem appropriate for their own uh, uh, district. Okay. We have just a, a small amount of time left. Uh, what is the next step for your bill in the process of, of the legislature? Well, we intend to have a public hearing regarding the bill that we filed out of the Joint Committee. We also understand that the governor is uh, in a position right now to, to make a proposal, so we're awaiting her her uh, initiative. We also have the UNS initiative available in front of us as well. 
Uh, we should have that hearing within the month, and from there, hopefully, we'll uh, take a, take a, make a decision legislatively. Well, thanks for getting the word out and sharing uh, your plan with our viewers, and I hope that you get a lot of people uh, at your hearings. Thanks very much. Tomorrow on The Globe at Home, shop on the street calmness. Diane Daniel will talk about a new perfume store in Lowell, Massachusetts. Join us tomorrow at this time. Live from WHDH-TV Boston, this is 7 News at 11 on the news station. Coming up next on 7 News Reports. It cost you millions to fund it, but is bilingual education making the grade? Too many kids are failing under the current system. Seven's Andy Hiller shows you why this controversial program could become history. That's just minutes away on 7 News Reports. Changes at the State House are setting the stage for the 2002 governor's race. In tonight's 7 News Reports, Andy Hiller says another ballot ballot is taking shape. Is it time to say bye-bye to bilingual education? 40,000 bilingual students in Massachusetts may be at the epicenter of a political earthquake. It should be changed. It should be changed, absolutely. Says the state education commissioner, with a budget of $217 million a year, each bilingual student costs Massachusetts taxpayers $2,000 more than a student in a regular class. Are you ready to learn the full fact? Bilingual students are supposed to be taught in both English and their native language. But a high percentage of bilingual teachers aren't proficient in English. So many bilingual classes are in foreign languages only. Bilinguals report card. MCAS scores are lower in every subject in every grade. And bilingual students are less likely to graduate. Bilingual kids have the highest failure rates. If there's a problem, it's because there isn't a commitment. Argues Boston's director of bilingual education. She says what these kids need are more resources, like teachers with more training, which means more money. What is not working is perhaps the fact that we do not have an endless supply of funds so that we can attend to the needs of all of our newcomers. In my opinion, it is unequivocally time to say bye-bye to bilingual education. It just does not work. So Senator Glotus wants Beacon Hill to cut back the current three-year bilingual program and replace it with one-year English immersion classes. I ask if it can work in California, why can't it work here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Once they learned enough English, in 1998, Silicon Valley businessman Ron Unz convinced California voters to gut bilingual education. Despite predictions, grades would plummet. But in recent tests, scores for former bilingual students went up, some by more than 50 percent. Last year, Arizona voters busted bilingual after Unz crusaded there. Now, Glotus will bring Unz here if Beacon Hill doesn't dismantle bilingual. And I would be asking him and encouraging him to take a role in a Massachusetts referendum if this was to go to the ballot in the year 2002. Unz says he's looking forward to it. Well, I mean, Massachusetts is a major remaining center of these failed programs. So the bilingual battle lines are drawn. Well, I hope it doesn't come to a referendum. I hope we can fix this legislatively. I think politicians are very intimidated because we're dealing with a minority issue. I think the people in Massachusetts would overwhelmingly vote to have children taught English in school. Would I vote for it? Absolutely not. Am I going to be marching somewhere so that we make sure that it does not pass? You can count on it. Massachusetts voters have already shown they will act when Beacon Hill won't. A big tax cut was the last example. Bilingual education could be the next. I'm Andy Hiller, 7 News. And our top story, the battle over bilingual education. Do students take too long to learn English? And is there a better way? Now, Margie Reedy, Chet Curtis. This is Newsnight on NECN. In Massachusetts, it's the law. Wherever there are at least 20 students who speak the same non-English native language, they must be offered transitional bilingual education. Three years of instruction in their native tongue before they graduate into the English mainstream. Some 45,000 students take part in transitional bilingual education. 
But is there a better way? Should English immersion be the rule instead? Today, both sides brought the battle to the Massachusetts State House. NECN's Colleen Harry has more. To have a, a Look at the students yeah. from the Amigo School in Cambridge, and you'll see something most schools strive for, diversity. So what kind of programs there are for kids who don't speak English who are new to the country is a very, very important question. Our focus is on four different um, areas. At the Choice, Massachusetts State House, Amigo School students and others joined a public hearing on the future of bilingual education. Currently in the Bay State, non-English speaking children can spend up to three years studying in their native languages before moving into an English language classroom. The longer children stay in native language classrooms, the harder it becomes for them to learn English. Lincoln Tamayo wants to repeal the Massachusetts bilingual education laws. A former high school principal, he says if immigrant children want to succeed, they need to be enrolled in one classroom and taught English and other subjects in English for one year, then join regular classrooms. These students, the vast majority of whom are Hispanic, are stuck for years in linguistic ghettos that none of us should abide. We support the legislative efforts to improve current bilingual law, making it more accountable, more flexible. People like Roger Rice, on the other hand, believe the strict one-year program is too much, like a one-size-fits-all that doesn't give parents a say. And I'm here today to speak in favor of the governor's bill to reform bilingual education. The Swift administration is floating a bill that would give local districts control over the curriculum in bilingual education programs. And the chairs of the legislature's education committee also have their own bill. With so much talk of change, students may soon see a different bilingual program. At the Massachusetts State House, Colleen Harry, NECN. One man has led campaigns for English immersion in several states. Tonight, Californian Ron Unce is here to advocate for English immersion in Massachusetts. He's chairman of the group English for the Children. We're also joined by an advocate for transitional bilingual education. Tim Duncan is a parent of a child in a bilingual program, and he's with a group Leave No Child Behind. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thank you. Ron, you're opposed to the law in Massachusetts, which advocates or mandates three years of uh, bilingual education. What's wrong with making it more flexible? to one year, two, or maybe three? Well, I think the problem is either bilingual education works or doesn't work. There's overwhelming evidence that transitional bilingual education has failed almost everywhere in the United States on a large scale in 30 years. Here in Massachusetts, for example, the students many times are not in these native language programs for only three years. Sometimes it's four, five, six years. I think the best way for a child to learn English is if they're taught English, and that's what our initiative would do. Tim, you want to keep things as they are, or do you advocate for more, uh, a more flexible approach? Uh, I think the most important thing is that kids learn English, and we all agree on that. And I think what we need to do is find the most effective way to do that. And what is that in uh, In my opinion, the most effective way to do that is to find the most effective way for a given child and community. And uh, contrary to what Mr. Oons is asserting here, we've been very successful here in Massachusetts in many cases doing that. Uh, if you'd like uh, to come see the school where my son goes to school, I think you see it's an extremely effective program uh, for a wide group of kids in learning two languages. And I think it's uh, not just some sort of anachronistic way of learning in the past. I think it's the way of learning in the future where how, kids get a wide variety of exposures. How long has your son been in bilingual education? Three years. And is he, re is he ready to go into the mainstream English classroom? My son is uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, and uh, has been bilingual since he's been about three years old. Well, that's, what's the argument? What's, what, what, why is it so difficult? Oh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, many well, of these... There's nothing wrong with that. I don't understand why you're trying to shut my uh, son's uh, school uh, down, I guess, would be I the question. If I can finish, if I can finish. Uh, uh, certainly, these bilingual programs, including dual language programs, like I think the one in reference, I, it, there's a lot of evidence that they actually help English-speaking students learn another language like Spanish quite well. And I'm sure your son is doing quite well in the program. The point is those programs, and especially the transitional bilingual programs, which are 98% of the programs, seem to have a huge record of failure in helping in immigrant students, non-English speaking students, learn English. So in other words, the problem is the English speaking students often learn another language. It's the non-English speaking students who have a hard time learning English. Furthermore, I want well, to say... It's not the case. I'm not sure what you're talking about because well, if you come and you look in Cambridge and you look how kids are doing there, both the English kids and the non-English speakers are doing equally well. But Tim, your, your situation is quite different. I mean, your son 
uh, was not speaking a language other than English when he went to school. Is that correct? No, he was speaking both languages when he went to school. Okay, but but so he, he's but in a, the he's school. In a the dual school includes language. kids that, that didn't speak Spanish before they went there. Includes kids that didn't speak English before they went there. They put them together, and they're both very successful in, in educating each other. And I think again, the point is here: we're very fortunate to live in in a, in a place where uh, they tax our arms off to to have a great school system. And I'm well aware that that's not the case all over Massachusetts. And I think what's important is that we address all the kids' needs. And I think what's important is that all kids learn to speak English in the best way possible. Would you agree that some kids could learn to do that in one year of total immersion? Absolutely. I think that can be the best case for some kids. I think the kind of program we have is the best thing for some kids. I think what it all gets down to is choice and not imposing a one-size-fits-all solution, particularly a one-size-fits-all that's failed miserably in California. We have a 95 percent failure rate in Mr. Unz's program. He's smiling now, but anybody can go on the State Board of Education site in California. We're here to teach kids English. And 90, I'm sorry, I may be exaggerating, 93 percent of the kids... I think the figures that, are completely mixed well, up. Well, let me no, finish, I don't think so. then I want to... In, in the last test we're administered in California, there was a 90, over a 90 percent failure rate of kids in Mr. Unz's program transitioning to normal English classes. Now, I don't know where he went to school, but 10 out of 100 is an NF as far as I'm concerned. We've right. done much better that, than that in Massachusetts. Uh, we can continue to do much better than that, particularly with some of the reform bills that are being offered in the legislature today. All right. Ron, what about the results? Now, there is some, there is some controversy about just how well you, that program now is doing in California. Oh, uh, on that point, I, I think there had been controversy. Anybody right now can look at the State Department of Education website or our website. It, it turns out when our initiative was on the ballot, very few people would defend the existing bilingual programs in California. They admitted that those programs have problems. They said our initiative would be far worse. It would be a disaster. Test scores would plummet. Instead, the test scores of over a million immigrant students in California have gone up by about 60 percent in less than three what, years. What test scores are those? We're it, talking it, about learning to speak me. English. It, I think well, that's what's important. Well, you know, he's, we'll get back. he's, he's well, know, making up I, statistics here, and I think he's the guy well, we'll, that sells we'll, his program we'll on teaching English. We'll try to clarify English. that. Let's talk about learning English okay, here. Let's okay, let's try that's to clarify that. Can I explain? When you're looking at it, for example, the test scores of Latino students, and we're talking about the standardized state star test scores, which that are California the California 9, 9 test? That are given to all the students No, why don't we talk about learning English? Isn't that what we're here for? Uh, can I finish? Well, Tim, let him finish, yeah. and then we'll get back. Because well, I think we have a point here, and I'm sorry. No, I, I, I know, but I'm sorry. when he finishes, we like to talk it, about learning English. No, I think, it's okay, well. but yeah. uh, the point is, this is the standard test given to all the students in California, used by the state for all of its analytical purposes. That test shows that the average test scores of over a million immigrant students have gone up by about 50 or 60 percent in less than three years. That includes those districts that kept their bilingual programs. When you look at those districts that completely followed the initiative and got rid of their bilingual programs, they've doubled their test scores. Furthermore, the data now breaks out the test scores of those immigrant students who stayed in the bilingual programs versus those immigrant students who were not in bilingual education, who were in the English-oriented programs. It turns out the students not in bilingual education are three times as likely to be reading, for example, at or above grade level in the second grade. In every grade level, every subject, every year, the students not in bilingual education do better than those in bilingual, and it's persuaded a lot of our critics. For example, the All founder right. of the California Association of Bilingual Educators now admits that he was wrong for 30 years that bilingual education <laughs> does not work, that English immersion does work. The president of the State Board of Education who opposed the initiative now admits he was wrong, and in fact, he donated money to help get a similar initiative on the Massachusetts ballot. All right, Tim, you can rebut that, and then we'll take a break. Uh, I don't think I've heard so many statistics since uh, Ross Perot was running for president. I think it's real simple. Uh, this guy and his cohorts uh, in California four years ago came to the California people and said, we need to teach kids to speak English, okay? And that means we're going to take kids that don't speak English, we're going to move them into regular programs. They haven't done that. As of the last test year, and this is a fact and it's simple, you can go straight to the State Board of Education and see the test results. They test the kids that didn't speak English last year. And they test them to see if they learned to speak English in the, and through Mr. Unz's program, which he claims he teaches kids in one year. 90 plus percent failure rate. Kids aren't moving out of that. They're not learning to speak English. All right, uh, two points. If it's such a failure, why, why don't California voters vote it out? And secondly, these standardized tests, I, I think that's including the MCAS in Massachusetts, don't really measure English proficiency, do they? 
the, uh, I'll, I'll address two things here, okay? One is that Mr. Rooms is running as far away from California as he can get right now, as is every politician uh, is running away from him. The, the only guy in the gubernatorial race uh, that, by the way, had the support of the President of the United States, just had his, uh, was one guy who had the support of the President of the United States that supported the uh, existing situation in California. It just got his hat handed to him. Uh, the State Board of Education is, is dismantling the program as quickly as possible. People are very unhappy with it. It's a total disaster. Right, quick response, <laughs> well, Ron, and we'll take a break. Well, then why would the New York Times have run a national front page lead story touting the tremendous success of the initiative in California? Uh, there are hundreds of other news articles in every major newspaper in California, most of the national media, television shows. Every investigative journalist has looked at the results talks about the dramatic success and again we persuaded the founder of the California Association of Bilingual Educators. I'm afraid my but debating partner here is severely misinformed. But is the Board of Education so. trying to dismantle so. the, uh, the, the Absolutely. program? Absolutely. No, no. In I mean, Mr. Ron's his, happened, his own words, let, let, in his own words, he stated me. that. What has happened is the State Board of Education under continual lobbying pressure from the bilingual advocates had actually made some serious, um, they'd certainly done some questionable, proposed some questionable regulations. Once suddenly the light of day was shined on that and the media found out what they were doing because I informed the media, they've now completely backed off. In fact, the executive director of the state board has resigned over that issue. All right, got to hold you both here. We're going to take a break, come back to continue our discussion on bilingual education. Back with my guest to continue our discussion on bilingual education. Ron, in this morning's uh, Boston Globe on the op-ed page, a professor from the Harvard Graduate School of Education said that in California three years later, uh, the reclassification rate remains at less than 10 percent and that the results that you talk about have been distorted. Uh, that's the whole thing. You see, classification methodology is very doubtful in, in that what we're talking about is students are classified as not knowing English if they're below the 40th percentile on standardized tests. Now, the truth is 40 percent of all students are below the 40th percentile. Furthermore, in California and most other states, school districts are actually paid more money for every student who stays classified as not knowing English. If you're a parent and your student's test scores double or even triple on standardized test scores, I think that's what you care about rather than you, whether your student is classified as limited English proficient or not. What we've done is I, double I the test scores. I think what parents care about is their kids learning English, and I think you dance around it a lot. The test scores indicate under your program they don't. It's a failure. Well, if they're doing well on all the tests given in English, I think they they're know actually English. not. They're actually not. I'm afraid you're really misinformed. But how could we be, <laughs> how, be such confusion over tests? I have the data right here. I can pass well, it. Well, the only thing I can say is that uh, I'm not sure what. Uh, this gentleman's doing here. There's an initiative in Massachusetts uh, that's going to cost Max Massachusetts taxpayers uh, tens of millions of dollars to implement. It's going to close down schools such as my son's. Uh, we can't even find somebody from Massachusetts to even speak for this initiative. It's, it's kind of interesting to me. Uh, I think that we need to look long and hard at this. I think the legislatures here in Massachusetts are doing a great job in coming up with some solutions so we continue to make sure that we have a success rate well ahead of California in making sure kids speak yeah. English. And that's are are you afraid that opponents uh, of this law will, will pass that uh, ballot question? Of uh, the initiative? Of the uh, uh, that voters will, will pass what this What I'm concerned ballot about is that he's got a simple message, and that is, should, you know, we need to get these kids off the street and teach them English. And not, people don't spend enough time with that, okay? They're going to vote whatever they think in 30 seconds in the, in the ballot box without really knowing what they're getting into, without knowing that this is going to cost tens of millions of dollars, without knowing for the first time in 300 years of the state's history, we're putting a law in the books that will call for teachers to be personally sued for what they teach in the classroom. Right. Now, I think that's despicable. Rod, well, do you predict this is going to pass the ballot? I think there's a very good chance it will pass because the people of Massachusetts think that children should be taught English. Remember, what we're talking about are immigrant children. Now, I don't know your background, but I would suspect that you don't come from an immigrant background based on your name and the fact that you can speak English. I think we're talking, what we're talking about, about is something to help to speak immigrant English, yeah. children in Massachusetts. This law will help those children. And to be honest... Well, then why do they have a 93% failure rate in you're California? Up those no, I am you're not. Anybody, up. <laughs> Ron, anybody can go on the web and see the facts, okay? You can I'm, talk all you want to, but the facts are right there. Look, 93% failure rate. The educational rate. reform bill sure. signed by President Bush uh, provides up to three years of bilingual education. Yeah, so won't honest. that cost school districts money? Absolutely. No, People I... on both sides of the aisle, President Bush, 
Senator Kennedy here in the state have endorsed a wide variety of programs exactly like we have here in the state already. The truth is the vast majority of politicians are very nervous to deal with the issue of bilingual education. And that's why every effort to reform or modify Massachusetts mandatory bilingual education law has failed in 15 years. The politicians are scared of the issue. Only the voters can change this law and you know, change Mr. it. Here's what I would suggest. Right, you want to have some kids and become a parent, come here to the state, and maybe you won't be quite so cynical about the politicians and teachers in our state. Okay? Right, I wish we had more time. Thank you both for sure. a very spirited discussion. Thanks to Ron Unz and Tim Duncan. Coming up, another ballot issue for Massachusetts. With coverage you can count on, this is News 40 at 6. In November, the state's voters face the decision on whether or not to replace bilingual education with an English immersion program. Currently, students unable to do regular classroom work in English are provided with bilingual help and often taught subjects in their native language. Under the new English immersion program, subjects will be taught in English using different methods for students who do not understand English. Rosalie Petalino Porter, a former Spanish bilingual teacher, supports the ballot initiative. Immersion programs do not mean that children are put in a classroom and nothing is done for them. While it is possible to deliver a very high quality structured immersion program, there is nothing in place in Massachusetts to ensure that high quality structured immersion programs would get delivered. Today's program at Monhoyo College was billed as the great debate over bilingual education.